But as important in returning to uh, play and practice is, is how do we return our, our children and adolescents uh, back to, to school and what type of modifications do they need? Uh, we have to make sure that we're doing that properly. Uh, to talk about that is Dr. David Salzberg. Uh, Dr. Salzberg is a licensed clinical neuropsychologist here at uh, NYU and the Rusk Institute where he's also a clinical instructor and he serves as associate director of pediatric psychology. Um, uh, Dr. Salzberg has been my go-to person uh, whenever I, I uh, see a, a child or an adolescent uh, with, uh, uh, with, with concussion, and he and his team have been um, extremely valuable in helping guiding uh, these students returning uh, to school, as well as providing the support that, and education that the, uh, the children and their parents need. So I'm um, uh, delighted to bring Dr. Uh, Salzberg uh, to the podium uh, to talk about uh, returning to learn. Okay, thank you, Dr. Flanagan. So, just to reiterate some of, I think, the take home that Dr. Codon just said, that the approach to concussion, especially for children, um, is really needs to be individualized because concussion, there's no one formula, there's no one person or, or type of person that gets concussed, um, and we definitely need a multidisciplinary, individualized approach. So um, there is a, is a very wide range of presentation for children. It depends on their age, it depends on the nature of the injury, but also who and what they were before. So children um, who are 16 and in the middle of finals, will their symptoms will affect them differently than a seven-year-old who's uh, going back to um, second grade. So we really need to have, um, for children, a very pediatric focus to all of the assessments that we're looking at. Um, there's a general guidelines and framework, but um, you know, again, the, the different doctors, different therapists, different perspectives is important. Um, the, uh, Dr. Codon had mentioned neuropsych screenings, and there are different, there's a lot of controversy on this. There's a lot of um, companies looking at computerized ways to uh, look at screenings baseline and screenings afterwards. So some of the neuropsych testing is screening, some are more in-depth testing, which I can speak, speak about. Um, but in general, the team, besides a team like at NYU, really has to include the family, the school, and the child. So when the concussion first happens, um, the, as was mentioned by the other physicians, there needs to be medical clearance. We need to assess all of the things that you would think of with medical, neck, uh, physical, balance, um, any neurological symptoms, et cetera. Um, and as was mentioned, the child should be symptom free for 24 hours before we talk about returning to learn. Some children don't want to return to learn, to be honest with you. So you can ask, depending on my child, the time of the week, the time of the month, um, I'm not sure how quick they're going to want to return to learn. But obviously, this is important. Um, it really matters what time of year, what kind of student they were. Um, you know, can't emphasize enough repeated concussions. So children who have had concussions are more susceptible, or can be more susceptible to more concussions. And the effects can be um, exponential. And as was mentioned, not all children will have symptoms, but those who have a history of symptoms certainly need to, uh, or a history of concussions need to be watched um, more carefully. And what we really emphasize in our center here, especially in pediatrics, I know um, Adam Graves said we shouldn't talk about fighting, but when we have to advocate for a child, we do fight with the school districts. A little bit different. Um, but we really need to make sure that the school system that's receiving the children back um, have the resources without fighting, preferably with education and with giving them the support for integrating a child back, but if needed, really advocating for a child. Um, so, as was just mentioned, and, and it's very important, we have to find this delicate balance between taking this invisible injury seriously. As, as Adam said, you know, when you break your finger or break a, uh, your, your leg and you're wearing a cast, you see the injury. Here you don't see the injury. And we're very 
careful at making sure that people understand that this can be, can be a serious injury. However, we also do need as a team, as parents, as professionals, need to balance that with um, what, the, what the facts are, which is most children will recover from this. Not all, um, and I want, don't want to minimize their symptoms, we want to keep very alert to it, but we do want to convey um, a lot of positive in terms of resilience and strength and, and recovery here. So always need to, you know, in, in assessments we always think about uh, where they were before, were there learning issues before, were there attention issues before. Um, you know, this, is, this becomes something that often when we go to schools to talk about reintegrating a child back, and we're really trying to get them to understand that the child changed. They had a concussion, there's changes in their attention, in their stamina, in their fatigue. Um, as was mentioned um, by Dr. Galetta in the, in the study in neurology, what, what's something that we find is affected? It's new learning. Well, this is a period of new learning. Every day and every week in your child's life is new learning. So even if all we're affecting is new learning, we're in trouble because this is an important time. So when, I, when we go to talk to, to schools, sometimes we hear, well, Johnny always had trouble with this. This isn't the concussion. What are you talking about? He's just pulling our leg. And you know, this is, this is, this is always their style of learning. They always had trouble. They, they were never great at concentrating. Well, my answer to them, in not such nice terms, not fighting, um, is, well, OK, do you think that the concussion helped the learning or made their attention difficulties or their learning difficulties go away? No, in fact, it actually adds more um, fuel to a fire that was already burning. So we always need to get a good history in terms of where they were before, what kind of learner they were, what resilience they might have had, or what, what uh, deficits they might have had. Um, Okay, so yes, they need cognitive rest, and unlike what the children think, that does mean video games too. That it's not only school that we have to advocate that the child actually rests, they can't just go home and, and play video games. So I just figured that that needed to be said. Um, so again, we need an individualized approach. I saw that there was some, uh, there was a table out there from Brain Injury Association of New York. There's some good data, good, um, uh, pamphlets and information from them, from the CDC, um, which highlights a lot of these things. Um, we certainly need them to be symptom free for 24 hours. We need to stress the expectations of recovery. Um, we need to make a gradual uh, return to learn. So that might mean half days. That might mean um, individualized instruction. As much as possible, we do want them, as soon as they have medical clearance, to go back to school. So even if that, thing, even if that means that we want them to work one-on-one -on -one with an educator, that can happen in a school building. It doesn't have to happen in their living room. So this is something that it requires a lot of negotiating and balancing with the family and with the school. Um, we need to, as they get more and more symptom free, increase their stamina. A big thing that happens here is fatigue, cognitive fatigue, how much harder they have to work. We're going to hear about balance. Require, if you have difficulties with balance, you have to put more energy on that. So anything that, that takes away energy, fatigue, any of those reserves are going to affect learning and their ability for uh, being available for school. So neuropsych assessment, yes, there's a lot of impact, there's a lot of different testing impact in all of these things. Most children should not require a full neuropsych eval in any way, shape, or form, um, unless there's a history, unless they have a long history of other learning issues, attention issues. Um, you know, it's sometimes important because that's what school districts look at. School districts, if a center doesn't look at some of these assessments, they'll do their own. So looking at cognitive functioning, how it's, how it's affecting their learning, sometimes will help a neuropsych assessment that's a little bit broader might help that. Um, but again, we need to take the context of where they were before. Um, we work very closely with educating the educators, doing in-services at school, um, again, advocating as necessary. So with the, a lot of this can be informal. If, there's, if, if the child is making progress and really just talking about a week or two, we don't have to do anything formal. I know there's people from school districts here. Sometimes we do get formal, what's called the 504 plan, which is um, without classifying the child accommodations to, to 
reintegrate them into a mainstream environment. Um, if symptoms persist or if this is insult after insult after injury, then sometimes a more formal school program needs to be done. Um, this is what a, a 504 is. It's accommodations to accommodate a child. That could be extra time. That could be um, where they're seated, working in, a, in the guidance counselor's office, anything like that. Um, the, if a child does have persistent difficulties that are going to affect their learning going forward, they are protected by the IDEA. And these are things that we can advocate from we can advocate for half days, we can advocate for special educators, we can advocate for private school placement if that's what's going to be needed. It's, they're all um, enti they're entitled to that by law. Again, a child with concussion should do better, shouldn't need all of these services, but those children that do persist, we do need to arm ourselves with the advocacy and being able to um, accommodate them and advocate for whatever school placement or accommodations are necessary. So recommendations, we always need to build in breaks, do things that c increase their stamina. Um, we need to think about interventions that might be, need, might, might be needed, those might be special educators, that might be physical. Um, sometimes people knee jerk and give recommendations, those shouldn't happen. Um, you know, sometimes people say, okay, just let, let them tape the lectures. If they're just sitting there um, and they can't pay attention, well, let them put an iPod on uh, and, and just tape it. Well, if that two hour lecture is not something they can attend to in the class. I don't think when they go home at seven o'clock at night they're going to listen to that two hour tape, re tape recording and actually get anything out of it. So these things again need to have to be, needs to be very generalized, very individualized, not generalized, um, and really work with a, a multidisciplinary team. So in summary, again, we need a team approach, including the child, the family, and the school, um, and a multidisciplinary team. We need to balance the rest and monitoring the symptoms with conveying that we do feel that they're going to get better. We need to be positive here. Um, but be aware and monitor, and the plans may, may need to be changed. It may need to be changed because of their recovery or symptom persistence, and or because finals are coming up, or greater demands are coming up. Um, and of course, always for your children, advocate and know your rights. If you need more support, use a center that knows what, what supports are available. Okay, thank you.